Hi, I'm Dylan Gilbertson, co-creator and writer of My Neighbor Necromancer, as well as creator and writer of Sweetheart and many other projects. You can find me at uh, dylandoescomics.com, as well as all the social media at Dill Gilbertson. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Jason Piperberg. I'm the co-creator and artist of My Neighbor Necromancer and other comics like Binary C and Star Set Delivery. You can find me at jasonpiperberg.com or Twitter and Instagram at Jason Piperberg, and you're listening and watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sass. We are joined today by two very talented individuals, uh, writer, creator, and they're both co-creators of this particular series. He was last on the show a couple of years ago talking about issue one of My Neighbor Necromancer, Dylan Gilbertson. Today, we are joined by the talented artist behind this amazing comic, Jason Piperberg. And I can't wait to dive into this amazing series with both of you guys here today. How are you both doing? Doing great. Doing good. Today's been an exciting day, and I'm glad that I could cap it off chatting with you guys. It's going to be fun. The fact yeah. that you have My Neighbor Necromancer, a Kickstarter campaign currently ongoing right now here, is amazing to see. Because when we last talked, it was an amazing first issue. Wonderful conversation. For those that haven't seen that, you should really go watch the first interview, of course, with Dylan here. I'm jumping ahead of myself as I do, though. But for those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. I'm Dylan Gilbertson. I'm the, the writer and co-creator of My, My Neighbor Necromancer. I'm hoping to bring a lot of undead and death positive joy to everybody's lives on Two Geeks Talking. And I am Jason Piperberg. I am the artist and letterer of My Neighbor Necromancer. And I am going to steal Dylan's line and also say that I'm hoping to bring some undead joy to the podcast. Undead joy. That's that's a new phrase. I kind of like that. That's that's better yeah. than death positive. Doesn't quite work with the subtitles, but but I like what you're saying. That's a great way to, to bring forth this. Because I, I think that's something interesting about this particular comics itself is a great writing, great art overall. You know, the fact that you're, you're looking at death in a positive light and you're bringing forth joy to those that get to read it. I think that's needed so much more so in today's age of comics you know i couldn't agree more i think there's a lot of um it's hard, it's weird to say this as a horror writer but i think there are a lot of comics that are i don't, I don't want to say they take themselves too seriously that they're too serious because i i love those comics those comics speak to me a lot but i think we can always use more that just have have fun as well i think that's always that's never not welcome is more fun double negative as a as a writer is always fun to yeah say. <laughs> um, I am good writer. You are good writer. I agree. That comes with a great collaboration because the the fact that it's a wonderful series, you both work well together. Talk about how you found each other and what was that first conversation like when you, not only when you were pitching My Neighbor Necromancer, Dylan, but also Jason, in terms of the art aspect, what was the first thing that came to mind? I guess for me, like, I always start with character designs. So when Dylan was pitching me the idea, once he sent me the script, I did an initial read through and was just trying to visualize, get a sense of who each character was, how I would think that they moved and that kind of thing. Just really, that that helps me get a sense of like, just how to pace a story is like how the characters look and how the environments look and everything like that. That's kind of where I started. Yeah, Jason and I uh, actually met. We are both featured in a Christmas horror anthology called Yule. Grant Stoy is the curator of, of this book that was went on to be Ringo nominated, which is super cool, very exciting. But after the book was finished, either right during lockdown, and we all decided to have a, it was a digital get yeah. together of some kind. I think it was a holiday party. And so we all yeah. got on a Zoom call together. Jason and I were were on it and we met then and now a group of us from that party from Yule still talk on a daily basis in a large group chat. We're always sharing ideas and, and giving each other advice and just sending off the wall memes to each other. And so Jason and I sort of became friends through there. 
And then I had this idea for Necromancer. I sort of messaged Jason on the side and was like, hey, I had this idea, threw it at him. And he was like, this sounds amazing and I'm on board. When we got to like the concepting phase of the characters that were written into it, like Jason said, like he was trying to figure out how they moved, how they looked, like what's their posture, what's the vibe that they give off. Developing that was a very organic process because when you're friends with somebody it's very easy to give feedback and like sort of bounce ideas off of each other and so really just grew organically from there until it became um, this cool thing that it is now yeah and it was cool to see dylan was very receptive with the designs and there are certain aspects of stuff that i would draw where he'd be like actually that gave me an idea for like a backstory thing or like some element of of like a character not alter the story a lot but like like point it into a different direction in certain aspects and it's you're talking about rackus's eyes yeah that yeah, one, yeah that was one of them right mm -hmm. yeah so yeah so if yeah. you if you read issue <laughs> one or if you've seen the concept art for Rackus in issue one, she's the main antagonist of the story. Jason drew her with these markings around her eyes and they looked like burns, almost like a domino mask type pattern. And I was like, this gives me the coolest idea for how she got those because Rackus as a character is very reckless. She always leaps before looking. I started building this backstory immediately when i just saw this design that he put into it uh she was very reckless when she first started learning necromancy and tried spells way beyond her skill level i don't want to give too much away in case we end up making a story about it later but this very advanced spell um ended up backfiring giving her these scars and everything just fit together so perfectly like jason said like his designs influence the story the story influences the designs and it just becomes this i forget the term for it but yeah it's just this self self-feeding machine Natural motion machine? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For some reason, my mind my mind went to the arc reactor from uh, Iron Man. Yeah, yeah. I thought uh, you were um, going with Ouroboros, but that seemed more negative. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to say yeah. that that fits the uh, the motif of necromancy with the Ouroboros. So, yeah. True. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, if it works in Full Metal Alchemist, it'll work here. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, stay away from kids and dogs, that's all. What is the biggest misconception people have about being a writer and an artist in comics? Man, great question. I want to say the biggest misconception about writing in comics is that it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people who are in the comics community obviously know that it's not easy. Even people who aren't writers, I think, understand that writing is not the easiest job. I think the greatest misconception about people who are maybe outside or just sort of casual readers of comics, because comics are very short by nature, at least the single issue is, and that the dialogue tends to be shorter. You don't want to crowd the art with too much dialogue, but you need the dialogue to sort of drive the story forward and build the story. And so I think just because of the economical nature, it needs to be very efficient. The brutal efficiency of comics, I think, is something a lot of people don't fully appreciate sometimes. And that goes with the art too. Like the art has a, has a purpose to drive things forward and needs to be very efficient about how it does that because the real estate on a page is very precious and very limited. Writing advice that you get just like in a creative writing class, in classes and, and exercises where you're supposed to be writing long form stories, where you have a great deal of real estate to be very verbose and use big heady word and make long run on sentences and things. Even in those classes, they're like, you need to be brutally efficient with your writing. Every sentence needs to have a purpose in your story. And that goes doubly so in comic. You need to cut everything down to its most basic parts and make those parts rocket fuel so that everything is driving itself. I think that's maybe the most misunderstood part of writing in comics, how difficult it can be to be as efficient as it needs to be yeah. to make a good comic. And that was a good answer. <laughs> um, I guess in regard to art specifically, I don't know if it's a misconception or not, but like, at least for me, it takes like such a long time. The time in which you're engaging with a comic, you know, like a graphic novel, maybe not so much, but like a single issue, it's, you know, you're maybe spending at most like 30 minutes on the first read through. And that's maybe being generous. You know, I can spend hours, you know, like somewhere between 10 to 20 hours, depending on the complexity of the page. But, you know, you're most likely going to look at a page for a minute, you know, like two minutes if you're really studying the art or like something really catches your attention. 
it takes a lot of time. The adage of like, oh, you know, it's an unlimited budget. It's like, kind of, it kind of is an unlimited budget. But, you know, if you have every panel is a crowd scene, the budget is the time that the artist has to spend doing all of those things. It, it does come at a, a trade-off versus like if you're doing something very simple and it's all just headshots or portraits or, you know, and depending on the style, I think people don't necessarily think about how long it takes to get everything onto the page. Just for the sake of, I don't want us to, to both have answers about <laughs> the misconception is how hard it is and make it sound very negative. I think I speak for Jason and myself is that like another misunderstanding is just how much we love it, mm. right? Like, because it's this difficult, it's very difficult to do this job without any love for it. And so like doing it, it's so rewarding. It's so much fun. People who maybe aren't in the comic scene, like because they think it might be easier than other forms of media are like, oh, they can just do it and just toss it away or whatever. They don't really care about it. Like we care so deeply about these things and it makes it so rewarding when it's actually put together. I can't think of a greater joy than when a comic is completed or when a story or even a page or a panel comes together and it looks and reads exactly the way both of us intended it to. I mean, there's nothing like it. It's amazing. Can you share any specific challenge you faced while writing issue two and how did you overcome it? One challenge that I know Jason and I both agree on is the design for Backstrom. We have a new character in issue two. His name is Backstrom and he is more or less a sentient suit of armor stuffed with twigs and leaves and just detritus of all sorts. And when we first started designing him, he looked so different. Jason and I, this might be the first time we both fundamentally disagree with each other. I'm trying to remember, I think Jason wanted it to be much larger and I wanted it to be thinner and like more, I don't want to say proper, but it doesn't really give butler vibes. We went back and forth for what felt like a couple of days trying to get this mm -hmm. design right. And then we finally found this middle ground. And as soon as that middle ground came out, we we're like, this is it. This is the one. Yeah, we're both very proud, I think. I hope we're both proud. I'm very proud of Backstrom. And I yeah, hope I like it. I think it yeah. I think it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love Backstrom. Why do you love that character? Or or why do you both eventually love that character? I love him because of who he is, what he represents in the lore of the story or of the world there's a lot of background story and a lot of world building that happens that we won't necessarily have time for because of like i said the brutal efficiency of comics we can't go off on a, this long tangent in the book to explain exactly who and where he's from unless we get to do like side stories or or continuation of it or whatever but but backstrom He's just such a lovable character. The idea behind him is that he was once a soldier who spent so much time in his armor that he told his lover at the time, he feels more comfortable in the armor than he does in his own skin. And so when Backstrom eventually died in his life, there's sort of rules to the necromancy in the world where the more connected a soul is to an object or a body or an article, the easier it is to fit that soul inside of the object. And so the suit of armor, the spell, for lack of better terms, was very easy. And that Backstrom feels very at home in his armor. I think the concept of that for me is very fun. And the fact that now he exists quite happily just to be with the person that he loves, even though he's not technically alive, the fact that he exists just to be with her, I think is, is very cool. I like Backstrom. And also I like the fact that he looks like a butler. <laughs> his helmet now, like it looks like he almost has a mustache with his helmet. Yeah, uh, we had to we had to finesse that a little bit. We got yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I love Backstrom. Jason, who's your favorite character in the series to draw uh, and maybe you enjoy their the story of that character? I think so far my favorite is maybe like too obvious. I think my favorite character to draw right now is is Cyrano. Uh, like the main necromancer I just I love drawing capes and he's got a big cape and so that's fun for me um, I love how wrinkly he is so I can just I just like I can go to town with like lines and hatching and stuff whereas with Jesse I have to be very 
careful about the way that I'm drawing her to make sure that she doesn't look too old. Like every line that you add to a child's face will age them up. <laughs> but I, I love drawing Cyrano. The bird, Aleph, is a challenge because I don't have a lot of shorthand for bird anatomy. Like I have to look at more reference. Like I'm getting better at it, but there's a way that birds move that I'm not used to drawing from every angle. <laughs> Keep sure. poses interesting. One of the really cool things that I like whenever you talk about drawing, Jason, whenever you talk about your art in general, is I feel like a lot of artists probably do this and I'm just not aware of it, but something that I just never considered was like, it's very important to you how something moves. Even though it's a static image, like mm -hmm. the fact that how cats, they have like this slinkiness to as they walk, like they're very smooth and they sort of rock back and forth as yeah. they sort of, they stalk things and walk and whatnot. Like when you were drawing Gavin, the the skeleton cat in issue two, like I think that's that's such a cool detail that it feels very important and i think really shows in your art like when i look at Thanks. Alice or when i look at gavin i'm like i know exactly if i were to make this a movie in my brain i know what that thing looks like when it moves and that, that was another oh, thing to bring this back now that was another thing with backstrom as well mm. we talked a lot you were like i have no idea how he walks i don't know what he looks like yeah. when he moves and I was like, I don't, I'm just trying, I'm trying to explain it to you, or I'm trying, I'm trying to figure it out too. And I'm also trying to find the words to explain what little I have figured out for how right. to move. Yeah. Because Backstrom has a suit of armor and he's supposed to be stiff. I'm always trying to make my work less stiff because I always feel like my work looks kind of, not like now, but it's like a thing that I've worked on a lot to like not have my figures be stiff if I can help it. And so to purposefully make a character stiff it's challenging and it's also like it irks me like I don't want him to look stiff so I have to figure out how to make the stiffness look like bouncy or something like there's like I have to a it has fluid, to make a sense fluid stiffness. like I don't want him I don't want him to walk like an action figure where he's just like you know yeah, yeah. you're like turning oh, yeah, him yeah, at yeah. the shoulders or whatever like there has to be some kind of movement and that took a long time to like figure out how to pose him and like maintain the butler essence i know i totally get it. i think you i think you got it too i think eventually I, like i said i think we landed in the perfect spot after after so much design work that went into him a lot of the animation or physical animation of like say disney films like bed knobs and broomsticks where they had the the animated right. armor and things like that like there's a lot of visual references or video references that you can find nowadays that just kind mm -hmm. of harken back to that style and and the fact that you can see your images in a fluid motion, in, in actual motion, is a real testament to what separates an average artist from a great artist. Jason, when it comes to the fact that you've done so many comic series, one thing that you didn't mention in the intro is the Raising Dion. You are yeah. the, the artist for that as well, which is a great comic in itself and a really fun Netflix series. But we're here to talk about Thanks. My Neighbor Necromancer. The fact that you were able to work on these different creative series what did you take away from the series you've worked on artistically and creatively that you incorporated into my neighbor necromancer it's a really good question i would say every project that i do there are obviously like challenges inherent to those projects and everything's sort of a bit of a stepping stone for me like i'll get better at one thing on on a project and I'll take that with me and then there's another challenge that I feel like I'm like okay well this is the main thing which is all of that is very vague with Raising Dion specifically I had to learn how to draw kids and that was also I think the first time that I'd done a book after college over 10 pages or 20 pages or whatever it was I hadn't done a lot at that point in long form a lot of the stuff that I was talking about, about like learning how things move and all that kind of stuff, I had to sort of get comfortable with that because also that wasn't like a traditional superhero book. So I had to learn how to like tone stuff down. Like not everybody is like in spandex or, you know, jumping around all the time. And then I I did a book called Patriot Tales, which also had a lot of kids in it. I, I, was, I was thinking about this today. Like a lot of my work has kids in it. <laughs> my Neighbor Necromancer has kids in it. Raising Dion was focused on a kid. I do a book with a doctor called Professor Nimble. It was written by a doctor. It's about inflammatory bowel disease. And so it's kind of like a magic school busy, fantastic voyage kind of situation. And there's kids in that. So like a lot of stuff I'm doing is kids. I don't know specifically, like with My Neighbor Necromancer, I think I really wanted to challenge myself with like different angles and like making sure that all of my panels were like 
very readable even in thumbnail stage which i always was trying to do i wanted to like up the ante for myself like i wanted to make sure that i'm not using too many mid shots i wanted to make sure that like the angle of a camera is totally appropriate to what the scene is saying and also with the lettering i think lettering this was probably one of the most challenging things i've ever lettered because there's like magic symbols and stuff like that no no it was good like it's <laughs> i had to i had to think outside the box about like okay well how do i do this like there's not a font that i can use to get like a, a magic symbol like i mean there probably is but it would look like I don't want to use wing dings. I want it to be like, you know, actually feel custom to this. And even like the way that the balloons have like different strokes. Like I have, instead of like a regular balloon stroke, there's, you know, each incantation has like a different, has a different type of pattern that goes around it. So it's like that kind of stuff is, is a good challenge for me. That's what I like about these types of comics is the fact that as an artist and as, as a creator, you're thinking outside the box. You're thinking in colors, you're thinking in styles you're thinking in glow i mean mm -hmm. especially with magic you have to have glow right or sparks or yeah. something to <laughs> to kind of connect everything together so that if you can separate yourself from a color perspective from a color theory perspective especially with different characters you know they have their own warmth or their own coolness depending on what you were going for for that particular character how important is color theory to you when it comes to creating or working on a new project for this book specifically, all the credit for that would go to Luca, who was Luca Romano, who was our, who was our colorist. I did do color comps, color studies for the character designs. That's my cat, yeah, or my roommate's cat, technically. <laughs> You're also doing the colors for uh, the pet commissions for the Kickstarter, that, right? Yes, I, yeah, yeah. So I am doing the colors for that. So my color work on this is limited. I am still like thinking in terms of it affects the way I ink, right? Mm -hmm. Like I know somebody is wearing like you know, a, a bright, like for instance, uh, Cyrano's cape is like bright yellow. There is obviously like hatching and shading and different shadow tones and stuff that goes into that. I'm always trying to keep that shape of the cape like open, right? So that it, so that when Luca colors it, it's a bright yellow that catches the eye. I guess in general, like when I'm working, when I get to a color stage on a piece, it feels like that's how I know when it's fully realizes itself a lot. Color is important, like very important in my work. And I think at first, it was a little bit challenging. Like, Luca is the first person who I've ever... Well, no, that's not true. Ryan Barr, uh, who's also a fantastic illustrator, also colored my work for Page Tree Tales. But I haven't had a lot of my work colored by other people. And so there's always kind of a... There's a, a mix of, I guess, kind of like releasing control and trusting another person to, like, do a good job and, like, not not be like, well, that's not how I would have done it, so it's bad, right? Like, because it, it isn't. Like, what Luca has done and what Ryan has done when Ryan was calling my work has, like, allowed me to see my work in a new light, which is also really cool to kind of, like, get an objective feeling of it, which is something I'm always struggling with because I, I look at it so much that it kind of feels generic a lot of the time to me. I didn't know that Ryan had also done colors for you and was, was the first person before Luca and now both Luca and Ryan are doing oh, things yeah. for <laughs> Necromancer. Yeah. So for those who don't know, Ryan Barr did the variant cover for issue two is also currently available on, on the Kickstarter. Yeah. That was, I, that's a weird, that's a weird, cool full circle thing. I think that Ryan yeah, I, uh, to get involved. Yeah. yeah I was going to say first person, but no, Ryan, Ryan, I think was the first, at least like on a main project that can't, I mean, I'm, I may be even forgetting somebody who I collaborated with. Well, that's good. Uh, six degrees of separation in comics, go figure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we didn't have to bring in Kevin Bacon, so that works out well. Right, yeah. <laughs> the Kickstarter campaign, obviously, is, is currently ongoing right now. And when it comes to this series, you've said you want to get six issues out. So what is happening in issue two Kickstarter? What can we expect and what can we maybe take a look at the campaign? Issue two, we have, I want to say, returning rewards from issue one, but that's not quite true. In the first campaign, we did uh, six by nine prints, and we have those again. They're different images. So we have three different six by nine prints. One is of the cover that Jason did, um, that Luca colored. The second print is the variant cover done by Ryan Barr, as we just said. And then the third print is actually done by uh, Laura Helsby, who is a UK artist. And they did also did this the moss skeleton print from the first one. So this will actually be 
the second in uh, a series of prints that they've done for us. Hoping to have them on for future ones. Very exciting if we could make a whole series out of those. That would be sweet. We also have new t-shirts. So in the first issue Kickstarter, we had the the skull paw word balloon that Cyrano does to dismiss the bear skeleton that he summoned. And the new shirt is, I called it the Gavin Sprouts t-shirt that Cyrano uses to summon Gavin back from the dead uh, to guide Jesse. And I might love the Gavin Sprouts symbol more than the skull paw, which I didn't think was possible because I thought the skull paw was so cool that I use it on almost every promotional thing I can. There's three different colors available of the shirt. Um, the sizes go from small to 3XL. You can get those. We also just had added a necromancer commission. Well, if you pledge for the pet commission, Jason will uh, draw your pet in the style of My Neighbor Necromancer. So you send him a picture and he'll draw in any any stage of undeadness. The necromancer familiars are inherently undead creatures. Um, but if you don't want to see your pet decayed, we totally get that. And so if you want them to look perfectly pristine, we can do that too. He'll draw them in the style of that and, and give you a, a six by nine print of that, as well as a high resolution digital copy of the image. That's super cool. Everyone seems super jazzed on that. We might add more. Issue one is also available. And so if you are just now coming into this series, issue one is there for the taking. You can get it either in one of the tiers that we have, or you can find it in the add-on store. And this is news to Jason doing those commissions, right? Yeah, yeah, I wasn't aware that this was happening, but I guess, uh, <laughs> oh, I, guess oh, I have yeah. to do a bunch of these now. Yeah, um, so. yeah, about that. <laughs> it would be cool if maybe you cleared that with me first, but I guess, uh, yeah, no, I don't. Obviously, I don't. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's the joke, folks. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah. Explain the joke. I'll explain the joke. Um, yeah. but no, I am actually very excited to do those. The, the one that will be visible on the campaign page is one of uh, Dylan's dog rudy uh, yeah which was very fun to do actually I, I yeah he was really he was he was very excited to be drawn that way he could <laughs> yeah he couldn't believe it when he saw it the fact that he could chase after his own tail and play fetch with it at the same time yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh that's oh. what we should have done because yeah <laughs> oh, the, that would have been good the image and yeah, the image rudy is holding a, a skeletal arm with a hand attached but yeah that would have been great if we would have put his, holding own, his own tail <laughs> that's really funny <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I have great. my moments. Go figure. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. What aspects of storytelling and comics excites you the most, and where does your passion from writing originate? One of the things that I think excites me the most about comic writing, and I think this could probably go for writing in general, but because I mostly work in comics, the thing that excites me most is being able to work through my own understanding of the world and maybe some things that I'm unsure of or am afraid of, or uh, if I think I understand it, it's always exciting in a story when you start from a place you think you understand and end in a place that you didn't expect. When I'm writing, I like to approach what I'm writing about from any angle that I possibly can to try and understand it in a different way. So like, with Sweetheart, Sweetheart is a very thinly veiled analogy for life with type 1 diabetes. And so I wrote that as like this monster that is just with you your entire life and you can't really get rid of it. And like you just have to learn to work around it and just live with the monster and live your best life that way. I sort of had this latent dread of like, what's it going to be like when I get older? Like, how is this going to affect me as I grow older? Um, and so it allowed me to sort of work through that anxiety about that condition. And I think in the process, I started to think about other people's strife about addiction or the cancer thing, all these different things that they might be afraid of or things that are plaguing them. And a lot of people who read Sweetheart sort of connected with that. And I think that was the most rewarding thing about it is not just me coming to a more comfortable place with my own situation, but hearing about other people who read it coming to the same, not, not coming to the same conclusion, but people telling me that they also related in that way and that it helped them in some way. And so I, I love that. And My Neighbor Necromancer is sort of a reflection on the human relationship with death itself. I've always sort of thought 
the human relationship with death was very complicated. Death is something that motivates us. It motivates everybody to some degree, for better or for worse. I think it motivates people to improve themselves. I think it can motivate them to do more with the lo their lives, with the limited time that they have. I think that it can, in many ways, be an influence on how we treat other people because we want them to have the best of the time that they have. And I, I think there's a lot of different things that I haven't even named, but the tragedy of it all is that we have to hate death. If we don't fear death, if we don't hate death, then it, it fails its job. It's something that we need to hate and we need to try and avoid at all costs in order for it to do the job that it has and that it does. And I think even, even when death happens, like you can find motivation from people in your memory you remember people to live up to their expectations for what they had when they were alive. And there's all these things that I could talk on and on about, but that's sort of how My Neighbor Necromancer, the through line for it, whether it's on the surface or whether it's more of a subtle through line of the story itself, like that's sort of one of the driving forces behind My Neighbor Necromancer. I don't think anybody fully understands death, myself included. And this is sort of my attempt to come to a better understanding of it. And it's me working through, just like Sweetheart, just me working through my own issue, I guess, and, and hoping that other people can find a way to enjoy it. That's what's very rewarding to me. I have a lot of fun with it. And I think it, I, I don't know, I love it. Like I said before, like there's nothing more rewarding than than writing and, and seeing a story come to life. And I think that's part of the reason why. How did you ensure then that your illustrations is effectively convey in this comic series uh, about death? I, I'm trying to walk a fine line also because it's a, a young adult story of making it kind of spooky and scary, but not being too gory, right? I, I think I want to have kind of a reverence for death and like the way that we're depicting some of these characters and themes rather than like a glorification of it. I, I'm always trying to like make it impactful, but not gross. I don't know if that's, if that's yeah. just like a, you know, I'm not, I'm not drawing like a bunch of also, and you know, Dylan's not writing it that way, right? Like if I was, yeah. if I were, yeah, well, yeah, that, we, that would be a little bit <laughs> <laughs> more of for the young audience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, right, we, yeah. We have conversations on almost a daily basis for how to, how to toe that fine line between two adults or two kid friendly and sort of sort of hit a nice balance. Yeah. Jason, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off, Jason, but no, no, go for it. I think what you said also is very important that we're not looking to glorify death in any way. Like I said, it's something that to be avoided is something that we need to hate and we need to not want. We need to avoid it. We don't want to glorify it. We don't want to make it gory in even cool ways. I'm a horror writer, so I love gore. I'm all, I'm all about it. I'm in any other book, I'd be like, we need to glorify death. <laughs> But yeah, certainly in, in this book, that's not the case. And uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it's important to understand that this isn't a book that's saying that death is a good thing by any means. How do you see the comic book industry evolving over the next five years, especially for independent comics? Hmm. Dylan, do you have any immediate thoughts on this? No, my immediate thought always goes to AI, but I think <laughs> I don't want to be a downer. I feel like the industry is definitely in a point of flux, which is I don't think anyone who's that's not an insightful comment. I think it has been for a while. There are so many people now who are making comics, either crowdfunded or self-published or with a publisher. And there's so many different types. Like, I feel like at least now, like when I was growing up and I was like starting to read comics, it was still what was being shown to me, what I was seeing when I was going to the comic shop was still mostly like big two superhero stuff. Not that the other, not that there weren't, other comics that existed but i just feel like there's such a wide array of creators and styles and and types of stories that are happening now and it's it's very exciting but i i do worry that not to be too downery i i do worry that we need some kind of protections for people in in the industry not just with ai but just in general of like you know cost of living and everything like like comics has never been a high paying job necessarily but i feel like every year especially for me like it gets a little bit harder to feel kind of like secure right like oh i can make this my career and i'm already you know 10 12 years into this so i you know starting out now it's kind of a double-edged sword you have like all of this freedom and there's a lot fewer restrictions on you as a creator but monetarily it can also be very difficult and i've seen you know many people who who are fantastic comic book artists just being like i i need to step away i need to stop 
doing this for a little bit because it's taking too much of my focus and it's it's not giving enough uh money back that I can justify it. I don't know where I see it going exactly, but it's I feel like we're kind of at a pivot point, right? Like it could be great or it could start imploding over some ways. And I'm a little bit I'm not sure which one which way it's gonna go. I think it's gonna go in the positive direction on that front. I think Good. because <laughs> because like you said, you we're seeing a lot more crowdfunded books. We're seeing other smaller publishers pop up. I mean, pu smaller publishers have popped up routinely for ever, it seems like. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like now more of them are giving a little more sticking power. And I think part of the reason for that is they're treating creators better. I haven't seen anyone's contracts, but I believe that they're being compensated better. They're being compensated on time. And I think that uh, like Kickstarters are built to pay the artist their wage and that's part of the reason the my neighbor necromancer issue two is slightly higher but that's because we want to treat all of the creators fairly like it's very easy to you know get a kickstarter made for 300 dollars or whatever some some small amount but like that's i don't know that's not fair to anybody and i don't think that's right i think there are more people now who are in the creator's corner and i think that's a good thing i believe that in the near future, I think there are going to be more protections. I think there's going to start being unions. And I think there's going to be, you know, fair, more fair wages. And I think people are going to start, you know, paying more on time. I think that's, I think that's going to be good. I'm very optimistic about it. I think it's going to be great. I hope you're right. <laughs> I would love that. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Hmm. Not the wisest, Jason. You have to throw that one away. I know it's hard. The second. Um, second wisest. I mean, I'm going to say this is second wisest. It's a hard, that's a hard dividing line. Make every panel one thing primarily, regardless of how well you draw or, you know, like, the obvious advice that people would give but it's very helpful to be like this panel has one thing right it's like a keyframe in animation like you you don't want to confuse people with with multiple things happening in a panel at least that are of equal importance right like if if, if you want to show somebody dropping a, a glass or a plate or something like that panel is that's what the panel is for right you're not going to also be like, and then the ants come in and eat the sugar that was on the glass or whatever. Like it's, it that's for the next panel, um, which I guess that could also be the best piece of advice, but it seems like maybe second best piece of advice. <laughs> I don't know. That's what, that's what I got. Well, some, yeah, if you, if you're too busy on a panel to panel basis, unless it's like, say a crowd scene or unless it's part of the action mm -hmm. of say, a like action that's flowing from panel to panel then that's something like you know like the flash or whatever like yeah if you can't decide what to make the panel what was an early experience where you learned that language had power i made a uh, comic that one of my one of my friends picked up and apparently that spurred her daughter to start drawing and that is a very like that just feels amazing like to know that that my art like inspired somebody else to want to do art even if it's not professional even if it's just as a hobby like the fact that that spurred her to want to you know pick up a pencil and start drawing is like amazing to me I wouldn't say it's like the main goal but it's always a thing that I would hope that like it's it's inspiring somebody to to want to express themselves and want to want to um further the the creative tapestry of of drawing and art everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today who is that for you might be cliche my mom is also an artist and uh, always fostered that with me taught me how to draw a hand. I remember that very distinctly. I was like in her studio. I think I was like on a table. I must have been like five years old or something. And I was just drawing and I was, she like showed me like a simple way to draw a hand. 
she was always very encouraging. She always wanted to see what I was drawing. And even today is always uh, wanting me to send her stuff. So I would say she's probably very foundational to me being on the path that I am on right now. What was the last piece of artwork you sent her? Probably the probably the dog portrait, <laughs> the the necromancer <laughs> dog portrait. Yeah. Um, yeah. I basically I sent her like most of the time I will send her what I have done at the end of the day, um, or she'll ask me. So I, I end up just doing it anyway. <laughs> From a professional standpoint, you are a successful artist and creative person for many years now, and uh, mm -hmm. you are doing some incredible work and you will continue to do some amazing work in the future. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Ooh, um, to a degree. Yeah, I think I, I feel successful in regard to the work that I do itself. Obviously, there's always aspirations for for more uh you know having having more income or you know being able to afford a house maybe at some point would be cool but no i think generally i i feel fairly successful i i don't have you know i don't have a second job this is what you know i do illustration full time until i make all of my money i don't know if i would have given that answer like a few years ago but i think at this point i i would say that i feel at least like moderately successful and the fact that, you know, when people say, oh, this is a hobby. No, no, this is my career. <laughs> yeah, I it, I think it's, you know, it's always it's always nice when, you know, if I'm out with friends or something and I, I meet somebody new and I'm like, oh, yeah, I draw. And then and then I they're like, oh, OK, show me what you what you have. And I show them and they're like, oh, OK, you you look like actually draw. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you're legit. <laughs> like, oh, like you actually like are. Yeah, like you. That's all. <laughs> it's, it's always kind of fun to, <laughs> to have that reaction. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Hmm. I try to be very introspective, both with my work and also like interpersonally to the best of my ability of like just trying to be better, right? Like every every page that I do, I'm I'm looking at it with a critical eye, possibly too much of a critical eye, and trying to really hone in on, you know, what would I do differently? What would I do better? Understanding that the the failure of whatever I feel that I have failed at or not fully succeeded at is not a reflection of my worth as a human being, but uh, more just its own thing, uh, which is a hard thing to keep in mind. I, I A lot of times if I have like a bad drawing day, it'll mess my mood up for the whole rest of the day <laughs> unless i like go take a walk or something i'm i'm constantly trying to to not put as much pressure on that symbiosis uh or if i have a good drawing day then i'm like i'm i'm having a great day then the, you know the reverse of that so just always remembering that your failures are not necessarily a reflection of who you are or or you know the kind of person you are are something that can be changed and improved right you can you can always get better. There's no there's no wall. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that and this is the kicker because you just answered that other question without realizing <laughs> yeah. this was the the last question of this particular interview. So it's kind of apropos. I, I you know I thought you were psychic there for a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you've already inspired one of many younger generations to be a creative person is a wonderful thing as a person and as an artist. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Mm -hmm. So one thing that I, when I was growing up, one thing that, that was very impactful for me was people who would take the time to give me feedback uh, especially like professionals or people that I would meet at conventions and, you know, teachers and everybody, but people who, people who I looked up to was a fan of, if I, I was able to have an interaction with them that was positive, it showed them to be like a good person, at least in that moment. It really, it was validating. And I think going, going forward, like every generation of artists is going to inspire the next generation of artists. And so you should never like let your head get so big that you feel like you're too important to like give feedback to somebody i mean with you know obviously there's limitations of that right like you can't answer every email but you know if if somebody comes up to you 
at a show or you know you have some kind of interaction with with a younger artist like just realize that like they are where you were and there's a symmetry to that and you should try to treat them the way that you would want to have been treated in that situation to the best of your ability when i was in high school i had to do a graduation project my graduation project was making a comic book i'm sure that's a huge surprise but i had to do one of those things where you email a professional and like get get feedback and on a whim I was like, I'm going to message Norm Brayfogle, uh, who, for anyone who doesn't know, was a, a an incredible artist for, for Batman and many other books. And he replied to me like almost immediately. And then at one point told me like, your work's really good for being in high school. Like, I'm sure you could have a career in comics. And that like, I, like that still like carries me sometimes. So just like, oh my God, like that's, that's incredible that like that like really helped me get some confidence so i think i feel like understanding that you could be that kind of a person for somebody else not taking that for granted if your life was a comic book what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be huh soundtrack is very dependent on what season it is i think if it's like winter at night maybe like some maybe like some some synth wave or something which is maybe like really lame uh but i live in philadelphia so like sometimes having like having it be really dark and raining and having all the lights and everything feels kind of synthy uh and then summer like maybe some maybe some like jazz or like like jazz guitar or, like joe pass or um or like the diddy bops or something i don't know i'm just now i'm just saying stuff that i've been listening to when i go on walks uh so, uh title Ooh, that's hard Jason time. That's great. That's an awesome title. <laughs> <laughs> Jason. But like you have to have that ellipsis in there. It's Jason time. Yeah. It's uh it's like it's morphin time, but it's there's no morphing. It's just oh, yeah. it's just it's just Jason time. Jason. You are you are morphed. You are the morphed version right. of yourself, right? You're already your best self. It's Jason mm -hmm. time. There you go. It's Jason time. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dylan and Jason, I do hate to say, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much thank for you for us. having us. Yeah, this is amazing. Before I let you both go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this amazing Kickstarter campaign? When does it end? And anything else you'd like to promote? The Kickstarter for My Neighbor Necromancer can be found at, we have a vanity URL for it. It's just necrocomic.com. Um, it ends on October 3rd. Please, please, please um, go and uh, and donate for it. Um, that would be that mean the world to us. You can find me, uh, find my other work and, and me at uh, at DylanDoesComics.com. Uh, all the social media is at Dill Gilbertson. I second what Dylan said. Please, uh, please, please, please go support the Kickstarter uh, at NecroComic.com. And uh, you can find me uh, my website is jasonpiperberg.com. Uh, I am at Jason Piperberg on all the socials uh, that I have. Uh, so that's probably what it'll be if you're if you're trying to find me. I also just released a a book called Starset Delivery. Uh, it is a slice of life sci-fi uh, with some action. A uh, comic about two galactic couriers or one galactic courier and his space dog. Uh, so you can find that on my on my link tree. Uh, it's self published. Give it a shot. Print copies will be available soon, but right now digital is is where it's at. Oh, and you can see us both at at Baltimore Con. Yes, Baltimore Comic Con, which is where I will have print copies of Star Set Delivery, and we will have print copies of My Neighbor Necromancer Number One. Well, Dylan and Jason, I do hate to say it, like I said, that's in this particular episode, but you can, of course, find Two Geeks Talking on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O, not the number two. That gets you to a website you really don't want to go to, trust me. Website's going through a revamp, though, so go to our YouTube channel. That's always updated, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after many years. You can find that at twogeekstalking.pondbead.com or just search to Geeks Talking, wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. 
Thanks for listening and watching on to Geeks Talking.